Last week, BBC's Hard Talk programme featured Extinction Rebellion founder Roger Hallam. During the interview, he said this. The capitalist system, the global system that we're in, is in the process of destroying itself, and it will destroy itself in the next 10 years. And then this. They've got another 50, 60, 70 years to live on this planet. By that time, there could be only a billion people left. Was he right? Does the science predict mass starvation within the next 10 years or the death of 6 billion within the century? Let's look at the evidence. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. Those of you that have watched my videos before, thank you, you'll know that, in my view, two things can be true at the same time. One, climate change is indeed the defining issue of our time, and I'm a big supporter of the UK's Committee on Climate Change programme to move us to net zero carbon by 2050. We have all sorts of challenges ahead and problems to solve, and we need governments, businesses and civil society to play their part. Two, that the tactics and purpose of the Extinction Rebellion group can be counterproductive to the cause, and that the group itself, with its stated intent of overthrowing the state, is promoting a hugely bad outcome that all right-thinking people should oppose. That said, as always, let's look with open eyes at the evidence presented. And in this video, I want to talk about Roger Hallam's repeated references to the science saying that we're in deeper trouble than we're used to hearing. So first of all, Hallam says that global capitalism will destroy itself on a very specific time frame, the next 10 years. And let's be clear, there were no caveats, no notes of uncertainty, but definitely will destroy itself in the next 10 years. Here's the full clip. The capitalist system, the global system that we're in, is in the process of destroying itself, and it will destroy itself in the next 10 years. Yeah. The reason for that is because it's destroying the climate. The climate is what's necessary to grow food. If you can't grow food, there'll be starvation and social collapse. He says that will be because the climate disruption will mean that we're not able to grow food, and that will lead to starvation and societal collapse. Well, what does the science currently say about the impact of climate change on our ability to grow food? According to the FAO's most recent report on the state of food security and nutrition in the world, we're at least starting from a hopeful place. There has, over recent decades, been a prolonged decline in world hunger, running up to 2016. In 2018, we got the unwelcome news that the decline had started to reverse, not primarily because of climate change, but because of an increase in conflict and violence in several parts of the world. However, climate is seen as an important secondary factor. In 2017, the number of undernourished people was calculated to have reached 821 million. That's significantly down on decades past, when absolute poverty was twice what it is now, but it is still one in every nine people in the world. Unsurprisingly, the majority of that food insecurity is across the continent of Africa, as well as parts of South America. We do expect climate change to become an increasing factor in food insecurity. According to the FAO, hunger is significantly worse in countries with agricultural systems that are highly sensitive to rainfall and temperature variability and severe drought, and where the livelihood of a high percentage of the population depends on agriculture, which makes obvious sense. If we look at the last couple of decades and track climate-related disasters between 1990 and 2016, there's a clear trend, with overall numbers doubling over that relatively short period of time, total events up from 100 to just over 200. Of those, you can see droughts, which are at a relatively low level and have stayed roughly the same. Droughts can be the most devastating to countries' ability to grow food, and the number and severity of these are, of course, expected to increase with climate change. Extreme temperature, low level, stayed roughly the same. Storms, higher level, slight increase. Floods, by far the largest type, significant increase of 65%. OK, but what about the thing about not being able to grow food in the next 10 years? In the next 10 years, we might hit 1.5 degrees C warming. According to Carbon Brief, that sort of increase, you would see yields from maize down by 6% and wheat down by 5%. There's an additional factor in that warming temperatures will also slightly degrade the nutritional value of certain crops, so people will get lower levels of nutrition from the same quantity of food. It's not a huge factor, but obviously not a helpful addition. 
Throw into that, of course, you will get some extreme events hitting certain areas, a major drought, like, for instance, the extended drought that hit California a while ago. In areas hit by those extreme events, then you would see some localised failure of crops. Now, around 23% of the world's land accounts for a large proportion of the growth of rice, maize and wheat, the breadbaskets of the world, and some of which are vulnerable to extreme weather events. One or two such failures are a problem, but obviously things get really sticky if you get multiple breadbasket failures in one year. The warmer it gets, the higher a likelihood of that happening. That said, nothing in the standard literature says that we expect the sort of widespread catastrophic failure there would have to be for Roger Hallam's specific prediction over the next 10 years to have any likelihood of coming true. If there was real evidence that capitalism as a whole was going to collapse within a decade, I think you can assume that even a cautious body like the IPCC would be mentioning it. Even at 2 degrees C, which we would hope not to be hitting in the next 10 years for sure, you would see reductions of around 9% for maize, 4% for wheat. Higher possibility of multi-breadbasket incidents for sure, but still not for circumstances to predict the downfall of capitalism. It's worth noting that capitalism has proven to be a remarkably robust system historically and for good reason. It's quicker to respond to changes in circumstances than any top-down state-led sort of government for reasons that we don't have time to go into here. Indeed, according to Alex DeWall, the author of Mass Starvation, the History and Future of Famine, the majority of mass starvation events of the last 150 years were driven by human policy, not natural disasters. In the last 100 years, up to 1980, the main culprits were colonialism, particularly the policies of the old British Empire, the world wars, and extremist communist economic policies, particularly the Great Leap Forward under Mao in China and the ruinous policies of Stalin's Soviet Union. Because all three of those had passed into history towards the end of the last century, deaths from famines had declined accordingly. And only 13% of deaths over this 150-year period were due to famines that were caused by external factors that governments were genuinely incapable of responding to. Most of those were deep in the past, various famines in Brazil and China in the 1870s. Now, famine came back in 2017, but the death toll from the latest crises have been remarkably low by historical standards, thanks to the increased professionalism and sophistication of aid workers, including their use of early warning systems. And of course, that's also a factor. What happens in the past isn't always the same as what will happen in the future. We are capable of responding internationally when a region is hit by famine, and the types of crops we grow will adapt to be less vulnerable to the conditions we know we can expect. That's an important thing to note, because a lot of the stats given in reports about impacts on crop yields don't factor in adaptation. They purely look at the impact on the status quo. And in some ways, that's how it has to be, because how are the scientists to know what adaptations are going to be made and how successful they will be? There are limits to the scale of those improvements from adaptation, of course, but nevertheless, they are factors. All in all, there is no validation for Roger Hallam's first claim that capitalism will collapse of its own volition in the next 10 years, except for his own wishful thinking. That doesn't mean that concerns about the impacts of climate change on agriculture can be ignored. So long as we are proactive in the face of changing circumstances, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to prevent problems from causing starvation. As Duval says, the only thing that will cause starvation is if politicians take political actions that cause people to starve by lurching, for instance, to a top-down socialist solution driven by the fear of climate change. That last bit's me, not Duval, obviously. OK, so the first one to strike. What about Hallam's second claim? Let's just remind ourselves of what he said. Teenagers. Teenagers are shitting themselves about what's happening for the future. They've got another 50, 60, 70 years to live on this planet. By that time, there could be only a billion people left. I mean, that's six billion people that have died from a starvation or been slaughtered in law. So in 50, 60, 70 years, there could be only a billion people left. Six billion people died from starvation or slaughter. It's worth noting here that, unlike in the first statement, there is at least a could rather than a will. 
I mean, it makes you wonder because surely if capitalism is definitely going to collapse in 10 years, you'd assume that things were so bad you could remove the uncertainty from the longer range prediction. But let's not ask for internal coherence in these things. Let's see what this is based on. Hallam doesn't give references for his prediction, but I'm fairly sure it comes from an article about a study by Scripps Institution of Oceanography that found a 5% chance that rapid global warming would be catastrophic or worse for the human race. Why do I think that's his source? Only because in my own interview with Hallam on the podcast, he quoted the line given in the article by the report author Ram Ramanathan about what he said to those who thought that a 5% chance didn't seem like very much. Quote, when we say 5% probability, high impact event, people may dismiss it as small, but it's equivalent to a 1 in 20 chance the plane you are about to board will crash. We would never get on that plane with a 1 in 20 chance of it coming down, but we are willing to send our children and grandchildren on that plane. It's a great line. And of course, it's an absolutely valid point. Regardless of what we think about how Roger Hallam conducts this interview, we should not be distracted from the absolute imperative that we take decisive action. Now, it's fair to say that this was one report and single reports are always more vulnerable to error than those aspects that get collected by the IPCC as being broadly consensual across the community. That said, Romanovan is highly respected and this is not an outlier report in the way that some might be. Like this guy, for instance. How much time do we have? How much time does the human race have? I can't imagine there will be a human on the planet in 10 years. Even Roger Hallam isn't quoting that one, which is something, I suppose. Anyway, the point is that, according to Romanovan, if things proceed according to worst-case business-as-usual scenarios, by the end of a century, there is a 5% chance of a real existential threat to life on Earth. Here's a specific quote. It is a real possibility, if we ignore this just for the next 30 or 40 years, this could slip into an existential threat. For the 3 billion, definitely. But how could it not be an existential threat for us if 40% of the population would have been wiped out? Now, I'm not going to argue about Hallam saying 6 billion when Ramanathan says 3 billion. We are obviously not accepting any number of billions as acceptable casualties of this. We expect and hope not to be on a business as usual scenario, of course. The UK and a number of other countries have adopted zero carbon by 2050 targets, and we hope others will follow suit, even for laggards, as the solutions get pushed to scale and the economics behind them fall into line. Even if we miss some important targets that mean we'll have worse consequences to deal with than we might otherwise have had, we should avoid that worst-case scenario. Extinction Rebellion will say, well, that's all very well, but you look at the emissions, we still seem to be pretty much on business as usual. And that's right. We need to see the results. That said, is it valid to take a single report, however respected the author may be? After all, people on all sides of a debate can pick and choose the individual reports that support their side the best. And in any case, is it right to take a report saying there's a 5% chance of catastrophe and then represent that in an interview with a very heavy implication this is a much higher probability? Hallam's defenders will say, but he said could, not would. But the implication was clearly with a much heavier weight on it than 5%. And it's worth noting as well that Romanofan himself says that this is a solvable problem. Thank God he says we have another 15 to 20 years to solve it which of course doesn't mean 15 to 20 years before we start. But Romanofan is not advocating for the extremist slamming on of the brakes or the adoption of centralist socialist policies. He's pragmatically promoting policies that reduce emissions. The point is this, my dear Extinction Rebellion critics. Lots of people who already support Extinction Rebellion watched that hard talk interview and celebrated what they saw was their man kicking the BBC's ass. The danger when you allow yourself to adopt an ideological mindset is you see things through a very active filter. When I interviewed Roger Hallam, I found him very personable and open. We had a great constructive discussion, which you can hear on the podcast on this channel. But when I watched that hard talk interview, probably because he felt under attack from someone who's not one of the BBC's finest, to be honest, I thought he came across much more extreme. The Twitter comments had significant numbers of people saying just that. It sounded ideological and unfeasible. There are some solid, shocking things to be said about the state of the science that would be very powerful in a campaigning sense, but taking 5% percentages 
and stating them as apparent certainties isn't it. Ideological people often completely miss the fact when arguments they think are winners completely fail to connect with the intended audience. Arguably, that's the case here. And of course, the real challenge is the inappropriate nature of XR's prescriptions for what should be done about it. State-led solutions, short-term slamming on the brakes, exactly the sort of policies historically shown to guarantee hunger and hardship and fail to deliver anything close to environmental benefits. The argument that something must be done, and this is something, and therefore this must be done, can be used to justify anything. And it's unfortunate that people have been so radicalised by the Extinction Rebellion pitch on your children will die, that they accept relatively without question what they're being sold. Anyway, that's all on this one. As always, links to scientific references in the description below this video. Mm -hmm.